wanted to find out what, how you guys are doing uh, in COVID and isolation. You know, we've we, it's been all, it's been all right. You know, there's a lot of ways for us to still socially distant hang out with uh, with our friends and family here in Vancouver. Um, I have a big backyard, so I'm generally the volunteering to host over here. So, you know, we we haven't been. I wouldn't call any part of this uh, experience isolating. It's definitely been unique. We are used to traveling and flying and touring and and um, certainly. Uh, used to a more high, sort of high speed existence. So the the slowing down has been actually really rewarding and has forced us to think about, you know, creativity in a, in a, in a COVID world, but also it's made us talk a lot about the sustainability and, um, you know, and the, the prospects of what a future will look like for us in terms of our touring and music career. Um, you know, I don't think any of us are going to just go back to business as usual. I think this has sort of forced us to really to really think about, you know, what is responsible and, and what will be possible in a post-COVID world. A lot of artists are rescheduling their tours already for 2021 and festivals are starting to come, you know, start advertising. And do you think that's realistic? Do you think we're going to be cramming ourselves into arenas and theaters next summer? I don't think we'll be going indoors. Um, I think that uh, personally, I feel like confident that there'll be some outdoor festivals. That's what we're hearing. Um, through the industry. So I think that some of the smaller festivals um, are going to come back, you know, at maybe smaller capacities, but I don't think we'll be going indoors. I think that until, you know, a percentage of the population is vaccinated, that that, that would be probably safe or smart for anyone. But I, th that's what's, you know, great about Canada. We have tons of festivals. We have a legacy of lots of awesome folk, and blues and um, rock festivals. And I think we just have to get creative. So, but I do think that that's possible. I think that's really realistic for, for, summer 2021 for sure up here in Canada but you know a lot of us we don't make our living in Canada we make our living being international artists and that that's that's that feels like a lot further away but you know there have been successful attempts at some outdoor festival touring in New Zealand and you know a few other countries um so I I, I do have hope I think the, the problem is the bigger question that I think Sarah was getting at, which is that what, what do we talk about as humanity? What, what's realistic like with climate change, with air travel being so bad for the environment, you know, the, the, the cost of bringing people together. I don't just all this stuff. It's definitely swirling in our minds, but you know, I think Sarah and I always try to think of like, what are some really genuine, really thoughtful ways we can connect with people that don't consist of us bringing, you know, buses and trucks and gear and people all over the world. So I, we're definitely dreaming and scheming, but horse and buggies. Um, we're going to be, horse we're gonna be doing yeah. like the uh, cross Canada horse carriage tour. Or whatever. A big Amish music <laughs> festival next summer. Yeah, exactly. totally. <laughs> One of the good things about quarantine and isolation is we can read books, including <laughs> What a wonderful school. segue. It just came naturally. <laughs> But I really think that the book is good for just even a, a, a teenage girl or a girl in her early 20s that's been through high school recently to read, regardless if they even know you or if they're fans mm -hmm. of you. Is that a is that correct assumption? Like that it's a good read for, I think it's a good read for young women. Yeah, we, we take it even broader than that, to be honest. When we sold the proposal, one of the things we talked a lot about with our publisher, Simon Schuster, was the idea that this was a book that would expand well beyond our our. Um, musical fans or even women, because I think something that's deeply relatable among all of us is that we all went through high school and we all were adolescents at some point. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of re relatable content. Um, I also think that because it was set in the 90s, there's a certain age group that will just love this sort of journey back through, you know, we talk so much about Smashing Pumpkins and Nirvana and, you know, Green Day and, um, I, I will agree and concur that that this is a great story for young women. It's so often that we hear about men's coming of age story, men in adolescence, men's musical stories. There's just an unbelievable amount of memoir and autobiographies about men in music and their journey and their drug use. And, and you just don't see any of that for women. And then when you look at the intersection of queer women you know, and music, it's just, it's, it's a no man's land. There's just hardly any books. And there's been some great ones in the last couple of years, Carrie Brownstein and, um, you know, um, Ani DeFranco put out her, her biography last, or her memoir last year. But Sarah and I just felt like, man, there just needs to be more stories about women in music. There needs to be stories about women finding their artistry and becoming artists and conquering the world and becoming international, you know, uh, performers. And I think that this origin story sets that up really nicely. And I think, you know, 
clearly the publishers agreed because they bought the book. But I, I, I just think it's important. I think more stories like this should be on the shelves. And I'm, I'm grateful that ours is there. I'm wondering if how your high school experiences would have been different if you had a Tegan and Sarah. It's a great question. You know, it's one we've thought a lot about actually over the last couple of years because, you know, so often we're asked, you know, who we looked up to. And, and I think our, our sort of stock answer was that it was really hard. There wasn't a lot of queer representation, especially not queer women that were in our age group. Obviously, we looked up to Katie Lang and Melissa Etheridge and Ani DeFranco. There were some really great um, you know, queer icons, but you know, we were teenagers and they were, they were women that were decades older. And so, um, I do believe that our youth would have probably felt very different. Our adolescents would have probably been slightly less fraught, you know, in terms of our sexuality, if, if there had been more representation, but in writing the book, I realized there actually really was a lot of queer representation, especially in the scenes we were interested in rave music, alternative music, but it was nothing like today. And if we are growing up today with Haley Kiyoko and King Princess and Janelle Monet and Tegan and Sarah, I think it would be really different. But I would also caution against saying just because there's rich, famous people that are coming out and living successful lives doesn't mean that the average queer teenager or the average rural trans person is looking at, you know, our experiences and going, well, I bet it'll be easy for me. Like, you know, that's not, you know, there's still yeah. a very small sliver of the queer population that does well and is accepted. So, you know, but, but it is better and it would have, you know, changed everything. And, and that's part of why we're so out and so big about talking about our queer identity is because if it helps people, even the smallest sliver of a way, it, I think is worth it. It's been a while since we've had a new album, but I guess, you know, what you were saying about the digital sphere, but <laughs> any hope that you can give your fans that in the next decade, no, 20 years, it'll be a new yeah, one? Okay. <laughs> My God, it's something, something devastating will have to occur for us to wait 10 years. But, you know, I think we're just being patient with ourselves. I have, I, I think the last couple of, you know, higher profile things we've done have been, um, you know, that the, our last album was, was a reworking of songs we wrote when we were in high school. We did a big 10 year anniversary for our album, The Con. So, you know, we've actually, in some ways, I feel like we're on the cusp of writing our next big statement album, like something that is hopefully, you know, lodged in the future of where we're going, not where we've been. And so, um, you know, we're taking our time. I don't want to rush anything out. I have no desire to only put something out into the digital space. So I think for me, it'll definitely be, um, you know, I think the fans will probably have to wait like at least a year, but maybe a little bit more, but we'll be able to tease some new projects, some new music, music related things to tide them over um, very soon. In fact, next month we have a big announcement. Um, we wrote a song for a, for a film that's coming out and I'm really excited about the song. And um, so that, you know, there'll be little things here and there to, for people to, to people to uh, digest while we're making this next big album.